All right, welcome to today's Book of the Day show. I've got a special guest here, Matt Lieberman. We're talking about social, his book, how our brains and why our brains are wired to connect to other people. So thanks for being on. It's a pleasure to be here. You live not too far down the street here. Not too far. UCLA is yeah. pretty close. Um, I read, I forget what book, I think there was a book called Top Dog by Poe Bronson, it's, mm -hmm. and it was basically saying, that introverts should match up with some extroverted friends because yeah. the extroverts will kind of naturally be like this, push them out and be like, hey, let's go out this weekend, you know? Right. And, and I see that a lot. A lot of mm -hmm. introverted people's mm -hmm. best friends yep. are an extrovert. Yeah, you know? I think that can work. I think yeah. it depends on the person. But yeah, no, I've certainly seen that as well, um, that you want someone, uh, you know, I've got friends who can't stop talking and yeah. friends who really don't talk much unless they're in the right mood. And if you put those two people together, y you feel less anxious about not being a talker if there's someone who just fills the space. Because yeah. they talk a lot and they're very sort of uh, yeah, yeah. gregarious and so on. And so it just takes the edge, it takes the pressure off of you. Yeah. You get to be a little bit more of the audience and yeah. maybe that works more for some folks. You know, I think the key thing is, is, you know, don't beat yourself up. We're all built the way we're built. Yeah. Don't try to be someone else. Try to find the things that work for you. So if this advice works for you, then that's great. Right, double and, down on yeah, it. Yeah, and if, and if not, then, you know, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with three shy people being best friends. Like, it's yeah. what works. But I think everyone has that need. And if that need isn't fulfilled, uh, lonely people uh, are really... Uh, at risk for some sort of bad things. Yeah. I mean, they, they, I mean, first and foremost, they're more likely to die sooner. Yeah. Like, you know, being lonely has the same health consequences as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. That's like, and that's like hundreds of studies have shown that. That's not just wow. like a random fact. Uh, that's a really well established fact. We spend millions and millions of dollars trying to stop people from smoking. We spend zero dollars trying to make sure people uh, have sort of more connected communities. What's the most surprising scientific breakthrough that you made or you saw made that you put in the book? Yeah, the thing that got me really excited about the book was uh, a study we did that's in chapter two of the book and is now something we followed up on quite a bit. Um, there's this strange thing. We do lots of things throughout our day. So, you know, if you're an accountant, there's lots of spreadsheets that you're working with and so on. And then we have these little breaks in between. You might just sort of be sitting back and kind of closing your eye in your chair or whatever it is. Uh, we take these little breaks and when we do MRI scanners, we have little breaks too. So I might ask you to do some math and then I might say, okay, take a minute and just rest. And okay. then we're gonna do some more math and then rest. And something that was discovered about 15 years ago was that when you have these moments of rest, most of the brain quiets down, but the network for social thinking shoots up and turns huh. on. It seems to get excited. Uh, and even if we make it so that you're not consciously thinking about anything social in those moments, you still get this network hmm. popping up. And so one of the things I was really curious about is why would this network turn on? Why would we be built, and we are built this way, so that this network comes on whenever there's a break in the action? And what we found was that it does work to get us ready for our next social interaction huh. by sort of priming us. So if I show you the word face and then I show you something that could or could not be a face, you'll be more likely to see it as a face. During this rest period, the fact that this network for social thinking, seeing the world socially comes on, gets you ready to see the next thing that happens in your life in a social way as opposed to sort of a, a purely physical, mechanical academic, sort of way. Yeah, kind of, you know, or yeah. academic, yeah. intellectual sort of way. And then when you're done with a social encounter, so when we're done with this interview, we'll go on to do other things, but during the little periods of rest that follow, our brain will keep reprocessing the social aspect of what we did here. And so- Right, did you say the right thing? Was, it, was I embarrassed? Was it like that? But kind? also, in addition to that, sort of how do the different people that you're interacting with, how do they get along? What are their yeah. status and hierarchies and who's connected to who? That way, the next time you come back, you know more about that social environment yes. and you're better prepared. So our brain does this even when we don't think it's doing it. And I think this is a, a pretty magical thing that our brain does. And it doesn't, it's not like it's practicing algebra in yeah. these breaks. It's not like it's practicing how to get to grandma's house. It's practicing and getting us ready for being more social creatures. And we would never know this unless we were looking at the brain and trying to sort of figure this out. Yeah, it's like Robin Dunbar talked about this. Exactly. Dunbar, 150, yep. we're, we're yep. tuned in to 150 people. Yeah. And that reason is because we're not just, 
it's not 150 relationships we're managing. We're managing in our brain, like you said, in the downtime, Bob's relationship to Susie, Bob's Susie's relationship to George. Yep. And that comes out, if you do the math, to about 10,000 relationships. So talk about that in the book. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. a big yeah. breakthrough yeah. in this book is that basically our brain is a continual social gauging machine. It's kind of a little bit like the pecking order. I lived on a farm yeah. and you know, chickens sure. can tell all the other chickens, even though to us, they look like all the same chicken to them. It's like, oh, that's the nerdy chicken and that's the one I can pick on. <laughs> right. That's the one I gotta stay away from. And, and yeah. we're basically, even you know, what's the famous poem uh, by Pope? No man is an island, mm. you know, mm -hmm. no human's an island. We right. are interconnected. Yeah. So everybody wants to know, you know, there's that famous book that I talk a lot about, um, how to win friends and influence people. It's like a timeless classic. Your book goes into the science of how, even if we think of ourselves as loners, even if we want to be, you know, this like lone bastion of strength, it doesn't work that way. Can you explain kind of the, the, the central thesis of the book, which is we have to have social skills. We have to fit in. We have to find our tribe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is what we're built for. Uh, it's what we're evolved for. Most of us think that what makes us different from all the other animals is how smart we are, sort of uh, how high our IQ is, how much we can be like a MacGyver sort of thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> and there's truth to that, but the other thing that science has found is that the thing that really makes us special is our ability to do things together yeah. and work in teams, to work in groups. And so a lot of how our brain has changed over the last 50,000 years is to make us the kind of creatures that can work together and want to work together. Those yeah. are the two special ingredients, wanting to be together and then being able to do something special when we are together. And there's a whole lot of our brain that seems pretty devoted to making us able to do this. And we don't realize this about ourselves. We tend to think that the smartest person in the room is the person who just because they're smart is gonna get the most done. And that's not the way the history of the world tends to work. You've got to be able to inspire other people. Yeah. You've got to be able to get along and be part of a team even when you're not leading that team. Yeah. Now you went to Harvard, you teach at UCLA. Is this kind of, what's the name of the class at UCLA that you're teaching? Is it just? Uh, I teach a couple of classes. Okay. I teach a class called Social Cognitive Neuroscience, which okay. is a field that I help start. Okay. Uh, it's a field where uh, we take questions that we care about in the world about sort of our social nature, and then we study how the brain makes those things possible and the way the brain works to do those sorts so of things. So it's a blending of sociology and social study sciences mm -hmm. with hard science, the neuro side of things. Yeah, although, you know, as a social psychologist, I would say psychology is actually harder science to do than what are typically called the harder sciences. Right. When you study chemistry, you know, there's stuff in a Petri dish and it'll do the same thing every time. Yeah. When what's in the Petri dish is people, they're gonna do different things every yes. time you try to do something with them and they're gonna to try to figure out what you're doing to them. So I actually think psychology is one of the hardest sciences. It's just yeah, given a bad sure. reputation. It's hard, it's hard to map out yeah. because it's so unpredictable. Now, right. what's the number one myth so out there in the world that the media is spreading that we've all bought into about our social lives? Is there one number kind of one stands out? Myth. Well, I mean, I think that in America in particular, we think that what we're driven by is kind of our own free will, our own sort of individual ambition, and that's what we are focused on as a culture. In Asia, that's not the sort of view. In South America, that's not the view. But in Western Europe and, and in America, we're very focused on being individuals who will not be swayed by others around us. Mm -hmm. But the field of social psychology is all about the various ways in which every day we are dramatically influenced by those around us. And when we see that, we think that's a bad thing. But mm -hmm. it actually turns out that if you weren't swayed by those around you, we'd all kind of be autistic, off doing our own things, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't do all the things. We wouldn't be able to build a house like this. Mm -hmm. We'd be living in you know little stick huts because we'd just build what we could on our own. Now, socially, I would say, when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. I remember being in the car in San Diego with my mom, um, and I, she was listening to the radio and the music was on, and I remember saying, Mom, how come almost every song is about love? <laughs> and she said to me, I'll never forget, she said, Ty, because it's important. And I was like five, and I was like, it's not important. What's yeah. important is, you know, candy and Disneyland and stuff. <laughs> so let's talk about the subject of romance. Yeah. One of the things you talk about in the book is if you have pain in that area, if you're broken up with, if you're mm -hmm. rejected, mm -hmm. you can't just 
toughen up and be like, you know, I'm not, this isn't going to affect me. What, what are the workings or the inner workings of our brain around romance? Yeah, so some of the work that um, my wife and I did, it's actually part of how we got together, this work that we did, uh, is focused on uh, how people feel when they're left out, the pain they feel when they're rejected. Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone uses the language of pain to talk about rejection, like all over the world, different languages. When people talk about uh, sort of having their feelings hurt uh, or having their heart broken, they use words that relate to pain. So we wanted to see, is that just a metaphor or is that something sort of more real? And so w what we did is we put people in an MRI scanner, magnetic resonance imaging scanner, yeah. and we had them play a game where they were then, after a little while of playing, the other players left them out of the game in a very obvious way. Okay. And people get really upset about this. They get out of the scanner and they're like, did you see what they did to me? Yeah. And they're like, oh, well. It's kind of like the playground, you don't get picked first for the basketball That's team. That's the or total, or you get picked yeah. last. Yeah, the, yeah it's last. the inspiration for it. And so what we looked at that was interesting is we looked at the regions in the brain that we know um, respond specifically to feeling physical pain. Yes. And what we saw is that people, when they were left out of the game, they showed responses in that same network. Yeah. And the more they felt bad about being left out, the more they showed strong responses in this network for physical huh. pain. Uh, and then the kicker is later research found that if you take Tylenol, you can make these uh, pain responses to social pain go away, huh? right? So the same sort of medication that you can take for your headache seems to have some benefits for your heartaches too. Right. Although Tylenol is toxic, so don't try to treat yourself that <laughs> way. So it was a controlled oh, study, yeah. but right. be careful. Yeah, I think that everybody at some point in their life is gonna have that feeling of attachment to somebody mm -hmm. and it's not reciprocated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's this poem, you know, that's that's like they found from Aztecs or whatever. And it's the same kind of heartache that you hear at a country music song. Right. It's yeah. like, no matter what. Now, there's various parts of our brain. I'm not a scientist, mm -hmm. but we have oxytocin, which mm -hmm. binds us to people. I mean, I'm oversimplifying yeah, the whole yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. this has this attachment response. If somebody's watching this, let's take a practical application. It's interesting, to, I wanna hear your take. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're attached to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. So socially, you've got, you're married, you're dating, and you know it's the wrong person, but you can't pull away yeah. because there's so many drugs go and hormonal responses in your brain. Are there practical ways to override these? I mean, this is the, you know, the struggle we deal with in countless things from eating food that we know we don't wanna eat because it's gonna put on pounds right. we don't want, right? So we have different parts and networks in our brain that uh, serve different purposes. And so there's networks for getting us attached, there's networks for saying, ooh, sugar is great, and then there's other networks in the brain for saying, you know, this isn't the right idea. Danny Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, yes. wrote a lot about this. He calls it system one and system two yes. types of thinking. Fast um, thinking, slow Fast thinking, thinking yeah. slow thinking. And, uh, and you know, it's absolutely true. So these two things coexist in our brains and, and they fight with each other a bit. Uh, I, I think the attachment one is one of the hardest ones and I think it's rare that we really know that we're with the wrong person when we're with the wrong person. I think it's yeah. something we really know in retrospect. And I think that in the moment, we know it in the following kind of way. Let's say you're playing, you're gambling, you're a gambler, right? And you're throwing dice and you know you need to like roll snake eyes or something. Technically, you know your chance of rolling snake eyes is like, you know, one out of 12, right? right? But there's some part of you that has this magical thinking that like, but I've got a better chance. Right. Somehow it's better than one out of 12. I think that when we're attached to the wrong person, people have told us it's the wrong person. At some point we can say the story of it's the wrong person, but personally, internally, we're like, they could be the right person. Right. And until, eternal. Yeah, because yeah. look, that attachment, which starts with the mother-child bond, yeah. that's gotta be like the strongest bond in the world, because otherwise, parents are gonna leave their children behind. Because yeah. who wants to be around a screaming, smelly mess unless you have this overriding impulse in you to say that's my screaming, yelling yes. mess and I wanna keep it close to me. Right. That same attachment system is at work when we fall in love. And uh, you know, we stay in love with you know, family members who aren't the best people in the world. Yeah. And we stay in love with people that we're in relationships with. So it's, it's really, really hard. I think you have to find the next thing that seems better yeah. And that's when you can start getting attached to something else. Oh, so you else. need to kind of like look yeah. around. And you see, yeah. you know, there's a whole body of scientific work talking about how women 
can all even when they're in a relationship often keep in the background yeah. a couple guys that maybe they talk to flirt yeah. a little bit to gauge whether they still have a chance out if this relationship goes bad and guys do that too yeah there's a lot of this is a big problem with and online dating has done lots of good things but one right. of the big problems is it tells you that there's sort of endless options. Right. And you know, a couple hundred years ago, the only options were like the three people living in the farms next to yours. Yeah. So like you got attached and you stayed attached yeah. through thick and thin because there was no one else. Now there's hundreds of thousands of someone else's. I actually think that makes it easier to not be as attached and that has some dangerous risks. So do you see some changes in the modern world where people are natural in, inborn kind of uh, instincts are being overridden by too many choices. I mean, you see that people yeah, come, sure. you can text, you can be on Netflix, you, <laughs> you can just there, you can social, yeah, it's just, just like swipe Tinder. to the next person. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, you yeah. think there's some negative potential there? Yeah, I think there's a natural period of exploration when we're teenagers and young adults, but I think when you have all these opportunities, I, I see a lot of people who have trouble then transitioning into, now I wanna be in an adult permanent relationship yeah. because you know how do I pick one? Yeah. Right? Who's just out there five swipes away that I haven't gotten to yet? Yeah. Uh, instead of really investing and seeing like, can I make this one work? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's a risk. I never worry as much about social media things as some people, because I think our core motives will win out most of the time and yeah. we need to be connected. But I think it's something that interferes. Well, let's talk about that. Social yeah. media, Facebook, Mark mm -hmm. Zuckerberg said one of his goals uh, would be to connect people. Now mm -hmm. on the other flip side, you know, uh, I live with the Amish for two and a half years. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. So the Amish, you know, what I learned from them is that there's something very kind of magical or beautiful of living in community, mm -hmm. close-knit relationships. Sure. The average Amish person's marrying somebody they met in third grade, then mm -hmm. when they grow up together, they get married. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people helping their neighbors. And now in this modern world, I, honestly, I always tell people, do you know who lives seven doors down from you? And the answer is always no. Nobody knows that, right? Even though you pass them every day. <laughs> Try two doors down. Yeah, two doors is the <laughs> In LA. next door. Is In tough. LA, yeah. So is Mark Zuckerberg on the right track? Does Facebook actually connect us or does it um, give us, I think uh, Adam Carolla calls it uh, moral satiation, where just because we see our old first grade friend on Facebook, we think we're connected, but really all we're doing is friend requesting and maybe send them a message every once every five years. Is that really connection? It's not in and of itself the whole story of connection, but I think it's like every other technology, right? If you've got a piece of paper and a pencil, um, you know, you can write the greatest book in the world or you can write Mein Kampf. Like, you know, right. you can do anything with that technology. And so I think the burden is on us to use it in ways that uh, do the things we want social media to do for us. And each thing that I do, you know, I do different things on Twitter than Facebook. Facebook is more, you know, I'll post pictures of my son for relatives who live a thousand miles away right. and don't get to see him as much as they would like or he would like. And so that's a way for them to stay connected. But then there's all the people that, you know, uh, you go to high school with and, you know, now you have this sort of tenuous permanent link with them. It doesn't make me feel like I have 800 friends. I don't have 800 right. friends, even though they call it that. I, I yeah. still have the same number of friends right. um, that I did before Facebook. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a tool like any others, but if we mistake it for something we can do instead of face-to-face -face real connection, um, then, then we will be missing something. But that's on us, not Mark Zuckerberg. I don't yeah. think he's saying never sit down with a friend right. because now you have Facebook. He's just saying, Facebook can supplement, and I think it does. And I think you, you use Facebook to reconnect, then you say, let's go out mm -hmm. to lunch. Absolutely. So like yeah. it, it becomes a bridge to real connection. Yeah. Now, let's talk about this subject of somebody who's watching this, they're shy, they're not good socially. Mm -hmm. I've read that uh, yeah. between 20 and 30% of the world feels lonely. Mm -hmm. And so what are some practical tips that you've seen uh, you know, from your book, it's been on my recommended list for about a year here. Uh, it's a great book. If you cool. go out and get it, I'm not being paid to promote this, <laughs> but I, I like, I, I, I share the books that yeah. I like, but yeah. what can someone do in all practicality? Who's kind of nervous around people who's a yeah. natural introvert. Have you seen some things that work for people? So there's a couple things. I mean, one is, yeah, there's lots of folks who are introverted and they have social needs too. 
they manifest a little differently. So someone who's shyer, more introverted, uh, maybe a bit more anxious, they may not need to have, you know, 30 friends that they're like out partying with or doing stuff that's kind of crazy with. Often those individuals want to have two or three people in their lives that they really trust mm. and know them completely. Mm -hmm. And that's different than uh, folks who, you know, Malcolm Gladwell would talk about as like being the loose connectors, right? right? So you can have lots of connections with lots of people and that can be useful in business and other things, uh, but they don't necessarily know sort of deep in, inside you. And so I think knowing what you need socially is one thing, not to sort of mistake the fact that, well, because other people seem to want to have 100 friends, I should too. If that's not what works for you, then you shouldn't feel like that's what you need. It's just not you. Then more practically, uh, know that lots of people are shy and anxious, and some of them show it more than others, but you feel your own anxiety when you're right. feeling shy. You don't realize that other people might be feeling it too. Yeah. Um, and so you just assume they're not feeling that. And if you know that actually most people, when they walk into a party, uh, feel like, oh, how's this going to go? Am I going to see people that I'm comfortable with? know that it, it takes a little bit of the edge off. Yeah. And then last thing I would recommend is uh, we make friends best through the activities that we share with those people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you love doing a certain kind of thing, try to join something where you'll meet a couple right. of people who do that too. Um, I actually think going to bars, like unless your favorite thing is drinking alcohol, then you'll meet lots of people at bars who love drinking alcohol yeah. too. But, you know, if your favorite thing is like baseball cards, then like you should be hanging out at baseball card stores and you know, I'm not really recommending that, but right, you know, right. that's the kind of idea. Yeah. It's a little hyperbolic. So this was so great. Thank you so much. Uh, so where can people reach you? You're gonna, I know a lot of people are gonna have questions. Yep. This book is all over Amazon, mm -hmm. Brookstones. Uh, what's the best way to reach you? Is it Twitter? Is yeah, it yeah, my Twitter feed is uh, social underscore brains. That's okay. brains with an S at the end. Okay, social uh, brains. Yeah, social brains. And uh, uh, yeah. You're at UCLA, you teach I'm there. I'm at UCLA, and if you UCLA Google me, uh, I'm the first Matthew Lieberman that comes up. Okay. Uh, Joe Lieberman's son, Matthew Lieberman, might be the second. But I think <laughs> I'm the first. So you beat him out, that's good. Now. Yeah. Awesome, so go out, check it out, amazing book. Thanks so much for being on. Thanks for having me, Yeah, it's been great.